now. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, or good night, everyone, depending on where you are. It's great to see so many people here. Thank you very, very much indeed for joining us today. Lovely to see so many familiar faces and names here already. So just to say, first of all, uh, apart from thank you to everyone for being here, thank you so much to the lovely Sarah Mercer for joining us today. Um, so I just like to say a little bit about Sarah before we before we launch into this. Um, as you all know, the idea of this project is to support teachers from Ukraine uh, during what's what's happening at the moment. Professor Sarah Mercer is head of ELT Research and Methodology at University of Graz in Austria. And I'm delighted, I'm so, so happy that she's here with us today. Um, one, of the, one of the main reasons for that is I have this wonderful book um, that she was a writer of, um, Exploring Psychology and Language Learning and Teaching. And one day I'm gonna ask, gonna ask Sarah to sign it for me. Um, <laughs> and, um, it's helped me immensely as a teacher, the psychological aspect of teaching, both from a teacher's point of view and from the student's point of view. And that's really what um, I wanted to interview Sarah about today. I will be quiet in a minute, but just to say to everyone there at the moment, please do continue doing what people have done, which is please write in the chat box where you're from. That would be fantastic. See what cities around the world you're from or what, where your teaching context is. Also, please feel very free as the interview goes on to ask some questions to Sarah. What I will be doing is um, picking out some questions from the chat box and asking them to Sarah as the meeting goes on. Okay, all preamble finished, I promise. So thank you again, Sarah, for joining us today. Um, can I start by asking you, first of all, so you're based in Austria at the moment. How long have you been there for? Oh, then you're wanting to give my age away. That's not a good start, <laughs> that disaster, really. But uh, yeah, no, I've been here for um, actually 26 years this year, which shocks me more than anybody, I suspect. But it's, um, it's very much home in the meantime. Fantastic. OK. And... I was mentioning your book earlier on, and one of the things that I wanted to ask you about today that I, I found fascinating about the, the book, and I think will probably ring true with um, a lot, possibly with a lot of teachers in complicated situations at the moment, is the idea of, if we can start with the idea of learner engagement, Sarah, could we do that? Yeah, um, sure. What, what is it? Can you break it down a little bit for us, the idea of learner engagement? Right, so we, um, gosh, where, where shall I begin with the story? Okay, so when I was working with teachers and we talk about the psychology, very often teachers would say, well, motivation is very interesting, but I can't motivate the learners. It's, that's not really the problem. It's about keeping their attention and keeping them doing what they're supposed to be doing and getting them to do what they're supposed to be doing. So that's what got me interested in engagement that I thought, yeah, a lot of the work that had been done on motivation was really helpful and really interesting. And it's still very relevant, but it was more about that kind of pre-stage of how you get them fundamentally interested in learning a language or fundamentally interested in maybe English or whatever it is, whichever language you're teaching. But it wasn't that stage in the classroom where you say, OK, how do I get their attention? How do I get them to to do what we're supposed to be doing and focus themselves on the task at hand. And that's the difference kind of between motivation and engagement. And the wonderful Zoltan, who we sadly lost earlier this year, um, Zoltan put it nicely as he said, um, you know, that's motivation is the drive behind it, but it's it's engagement that's the that's the action. It's what you actually do. That's where the learning takes place. So that's how we got interested in engagement and started to look a little bit more closely at what it was and how does it work. So there are sort of three, um, yeah, okay. So there are three bits to engagement. So you have cognitive engagement, effective engagement, and behavioral engagement. And the idea is that when a learner is truly engaged, they're thinking about what they're doing, they're emotionally invested in it, and they're actively involved in doing it. And to be authentically engaged, ideally you do all three. So that's to sort of 
compare it with something like more superficial engagement where you're just going through the motions you're doing what your teacher tells you to do but you're not really paying much attention you're not invested in it in any way you're not you know you're not deeply in, in engaged with it in that way so those are the kind of components of engagement and Zoltan and I were thinking about so okay so when we go into the classroom and, and you know I don't I, I teach teacher educators more than I teach language teaching now but it's utterly relevant for my teaching as well I think it's relevant for anyone is what do I do how do I get my learners my students engaged and we came to the conclusion that we're kind of sort of three a three phase model and we make this sound very linear and of course every teacher in the room knows it's not like that but it helps break down some of the component parts of engagement so the first bit is you create the willingness to engage and that means you've got to build up that emotional climate you've got to build the relationship they've got to feel at ease with each other they've got to feel that they're seen and they're heard as learners that they matter to the teacher that their learning matters to the teacher so that willingness to engage is kind of all the social emotional climate that you create between you as a teacher and the learner, but also among the learners. And that's the foundation on which we build, because if that's not working well, even if you've got fantastically exciting activities, you're going to have a little bit more difficulty in getting them engaged. So that was sort of stage one. And then we talked about the distinction between triggering engagement, so capturing their attention somehow, getting them getting their interest peaked so that they want to know a little bit more, basically making them curious and then keeping them engaged. So what do, what is the nature of the task that they actually want to keep doing it, that they keep on task? Because we need, you know, getting their attention is one thing. Keeping their attention is something else. So we split it into those sort of three components is willingness to create that the willingness to create willingness to engage, which is that kind of social emotional climate that you create that basis on which you build that. And then in the activities or the lesson, how do you get their attention? What's the trigger for the engagement, the curiosity? And then how do you design the test so you keep them engaged? And that primarily is about keeping them active and keeping that curiosity going, keeping that curiosity active. Okay, so in terms of like getting the attention, as it were, from from the outset, is that something like? Well, presumably, we're not just talking about things like okay, let's let's play games on Kahoot and things like that. Well, no, <laughs> but you know, sometimes that's perfectly okay as well. Yeah. I don't think there's like a magic recipe for this. Mm. And I think that's sort of part of the problem. So what Zoltan and I did in the book on engagement is we said, look, these are some of the principles to help us understand what engagement is. And knowing the different contexts that people in this room are working in, um, it depends what resources you've got, how you're going to apply that. So if we know we've got to make them curious, how can we do that? And the very, you know, very simple things about creating curiosity, get them to ask questions get them to make predictions, um, get them to make guesses about what they think is happening, stop partway through something and get them to make more predictions, get them to ask questions, um, handing over control to the learner, let them make decisions and choices, giving them that agency where they can. Are we gonna read this question? Are we gonna read this text or this text? Um, we've got six questions that we've got to answer, which one should we do first? even little bits and you know and i'm thinking particularly of people working in difficult circumstances any any teachers working in compulsory education are up against the fact that the kids are there not of their own volition they're there because they have to be there um, and they have very little control over the fact that they're in school they have to go to school so every little bit of control we can give to the learners that they feel they have some say over what happens to them makes a massive impact on how engaged they feel because it's it's their learning and they have some control now you know this, this, I, i'm not talking about handing over them and let them go free reign i'm talking about little things and you build up as much as you can manage in your setting but it can be things like saying okay guys do we think we need 10 minutes to do this or can we perhaps get it done in five let's have a little look what do you think five minutes or 10 minutes and you know, to you, it's no big deal, but to them, it's just asking them that question, getting them involved, giving them that sense of ownership that can be quite impactful on how they feel that one that they're being, you know, it's all part of the same mix, isn't it? Making them feel that they've been taken seriously, making them feel that they have a voice, that they're being listened to, that what they have, but also giving them that sense of control that they can guide a little bit what happens. You're working with a textbook and you've got questions, you've got exercises to do. Say, OK, look, we've got 10 questions uh, or 10. I don't know. I'm, I'm simplifying here, but OK, there's 10 gap fill activities to do. 
Guys, you choose the five that you want to do and then see if you can find somebody else in the room who's picked some of the ones that you've picked and compare your answers. So they're, they're just little things that you can do with existent materials, activities and so on that just hand over that little feeling of control that gets them involved, that gets them curious, it gets them to dictate a little bit the pathway of what's going to happen in the class. And it sounds like um, the kind of age group you're talking about here, specifically at the moment, you correct me if I'm wrong, you seem to be referring to like younger learners at the moment, is that right? I'm, I'm talking mostly about secondary age group. You know, that's, that's to be fair, that was the main audience that we had in mind with the book. But a lot of these things apply <laughs> all the way through. Adults like to have choice. We don't like to be told what to do. Um, you know, little kids, I mean, anyone who knows children under the age of five, their favorite question is why, why, why? Everything is why. Um, so, you know, um, I, I, think, I think a lot of these principles about engagement and learning, you know, they apply all the way through the spectrum of education. But I think some of the things, you know, some of the things we know is that younger learners have more difficulty reflecting metacognitively, for example. So some of those kinds of activities are not going to work well with young learners. Um, games, you know what? Adults love games and they, they don't grow out of games. Um, so I think some of the principles actually apply across a broader range of, of ages, um, although I admit that we, we focused primarily on secondary when we were writing the book. That was our sort of target audience we had in mind. Because the, the kind of motivation that I think you're talking about at the, for, for a lot of students in secondary, uh, I, I think a lot of the teachers here today probably teach across the board, but I'm sure nearly everyone here is involved in or has been involved in teaching younger learners. Um, it's extrinsic, isn't it? I suppose a lot of the motivation is it like you're saying it comes from outside, either from the parents or family caregivers, whoever they are saying, you know, you, you, you've got to go to your institute or whatever it is and, and learn English. And so what what you're talking about is, in a way, sort of turning that from something that they have to do to some because of that to something they have some kind of say in is go on sorry <laughs> no, I was just going to say that yeah. I'm actually really glad you brought it up so extrinsic you know extrinsic motivation got this really bad reputation as being like the bad motivation and of course that's not true any motivation will do quite frankly at the beginning and if they're extrinsically motivated well you know what that's a starting point and you can build on that and the type of way that you engage with learners the type of experiences they have in their class that can change extrinsic motivation and you can develop out of that a more intrinsic motivation so i think that there's been this kind of well, I'm exaggerating, but this kind of demonization of extrinsic motivation is like the bad motivation and it's not the motivation we want. You know what? Just be pragmatic. You work with what you've got. Extrinsic motivation, that's fine. You start with that and you, you see where you go with that. And for some learners, extrinsic motivation is all you're going to get. And you know what? That, that's just how it is. You do the best that you can. So I don't think extrinsic motivation is a bad thing. And when you understand the original continuum of intrinsic to extrinsic motivation, you realize that they're not polar opposites, they're points on a continuum. So once you understand that the, the extrinsic and ext intrinsic are not, are not dichotomous separate categories, they're points on a continuum, then you realize that you can move them gradually along that point so that it's more extrinsic or more intrinsic. And it's not like you're trying to switch from one type to the other. I think that's also perhaps helpful when you conceptualize it like this, that you realize you're not making a switch to a completely different type of motivation. You're just helping them inch along that continuum towards something that maybe they've got a, a greater sense of mastery and ownership of. That's really lovely. I'm going to come to a question that's in the chat box in a second. But before that, I just want to say that's very, very interesting. It's something I've never thought about before is the way that you've just put it is that it's not that because we learn on teacher training on CELTA, DELTA, et cetera, and um, teacher training degrees about different types of motivations. And that's very interesting what you're saying. So it's not that you've got them in these sort of isolated boxes, as it were, they're points on a continuum. Yeah, that's, that's right. I love that. I really love that because that's actually quite freeing in a way, isn't oh, it? I can, I can go home now. I've done something. <laughs> 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 no, I'm afraid you're stuck with us for a little while longer. That's good. That's great, Sarah. Okay. Um, I will ask this question that's it's already come up in the chat box, but Lana has asked if you could kindly give an example of how you can trigger curiosity against different age groups. Yeah, that's a really good one. So I think one of the big things about curiosity is curiosity is, um, they call it the mental it. 
it's where you you need to you need to satisfy that itch you need to know what it is now curiosity there's two different types of curiosity but one of them can be fundamentally about what you're interested in so that's where you build in you know passion projects you allow them to work on things that are of interest to them and um, they bring in stuff from home they bring in their hobbies that's one kind of curiosity that builds on this kind of passion that they have and in interest in something that is perhaps beyond and then there's this sort of state curiosity that in the moment curiosity and that kind of curiosity is triggered through not having closure basically not knowing the answer um, uncertainty unpredictability um, and openness willingness to explore um, so any kind of asking questions and um, getting them to make predictions are they right are they wrong um, getting them to um, posing them a challenge that they have to try and solve or find the answer to um, exploring some kind of mystery and these can be little things like having a picture and you know and what happened next or what happened before this or you know taking parts of a headline and things that I think a lot of teachers do already particularly with reading activities a lot of pre-reading activities are designed specifically to trigger that curiosity to get learners thinking ahead what could this be about what might the answers be and get the learners to write questions to what they think that it, what questions do you think this text will answer and then after it's okay did the text answer your questions do you have some questions it didn't answer and where can we find the answers to those so any of the kinds of, the, you know, the distinction between using curiosity that they already have for things that they're interested in, that's one type of curiosity that you can build on. And then there's other type of curiosity where you look at the task design and particularly the pre-activities, you know, pre-reading, pre-listening, uh, pre-writing, pre-speaking. Is there some way that you can create this dissonance that there's something they don't know that they get curious about that they want to find the answer to or they want to get a resolution to they want to get some solution to i don't know if um, that helps lana okay. i i think it helps greatly and i was just thinking as you were talking about the dissonance aspect of it and i'm going to slightly play devil's advocate here yeah. what what if because i'm sure some of the teachers out there might agree with me you have a class of um, of teens, let's say, who have this fame, either deserved or undeserved, as it were, um, of being like lacking interest in general. Um, what would you say? What would you say to that? Do you agree with it, or do you think it's a question um, of finding the trigger? Yes, it's a question of finding the trigger, but that's time-consuming and it's difficult and it's not easy to do. So, don't get me wrong. It's not mm. like I'm telling you things to do here, and this is going to be the magic panacea. Every teacher in this room knows that there's no magic solution. If there was, I'd have made my millions by now and I'd be on a tropical beach in the Caribbean. So, there, there, you know, there is no magic, easy answer to any of those questions. And working with teenagers is difficult. That's why if you work with teenagers, you're somebody to be greatly respected automatically because it's not easy because um, because they are a difficult age and they're going through all kinds of difficult things. And there are things competing in their lives in school and English might be way down on their list of priorities. Mm. Um, that's the challenge of being a teacher. And there, there, there are no easy solutions to that. That's the craft and the art of being an educator. Um, but I, I do strongly believe from everything I know about teenagers that there are things that they are interested in. And it is about trying to find what they are, trying to make that connection, and sometimes trying to give them the space to bring those interests into what we do. Um, so I, I don't believe they're not interested in anything. Mm. I just think that it's not an easy thing to find what they're interested in, mm. get them to articulate and be able to necessarily connect to that. In, in school right. um, but I don't believe that they're not interested in anything at all. So one of our uh, obligations therefore as teachers is to really um, find out about us in not necessarily intrusively but certainly finding out about our students what makes them tick and things like that. Yeah, you know, obviously making tip, but you know, um, if you look at a lot of the things, a lot of the things that have been shown in research to be very effective in terms of engagement are things like passion projects, genius hours, um, any kind of project based learning. So passion projects, genius hours, they're basically where you say, okay, you're going to set aside a certain amount of time each week, and it can just be 10 minutes where they work on something they are passionate about, their passion project. And they have some kind of, you know, you can do this as research-based, you can do it as project-based, you can do inquiry-based, there's different sort of formats that you can follow. 
but it's essentially giving them the space and the time to follow their interests and bring that in. A, a lovely story, this is not from me, and I honestly wish I could remember who it was. It's a teacher that I spoke to or read or I don't remember now. And he talked about he had a, a, um, a boy in his class who was very, very difficult to connect with and he didn't connect with the other learners and so on. And they gave him the chance to teach a lesson on what he was passionate about. And it turned out it was model planes. So what the teacher did was the teacher bought three model planes and put the students in groups and allowed this boy to be the teacher for the day and to teach the other students how to build these model planes and what they needed and little tricks and tips. And OK, I'm not saying that we all have to go and do this every time, but this was a special case and this guy was having problems with this kid. And what a lovely way to get the teacher to the learner can be an expert. You let them take over and it's all taking place in English. They're learning English. They're using their English to do something. They allow them to share their passion, but it allows them to be an expert for a change and it allows them to take over that role. Um, and what a, what a, it wasn't my idea, so it's not, I can't take any credit for it, but I just read or heard or talked about it and thought, what a lovely idea. So it doesn't have to be on that scale, but those little opportunities for them to show you what they can do and what they're passionate about and what they're excited about and what they know and allow them to be an expert. And, you know, it's about, you know, one of the things I've, I used to do a lot in my language teaching, I used to love it, and probably because I'm just nosy about my students and I like to get to know them, was to ask them to tell me their story. What do they want to tell me? You know, not forcing them to tell me, but tell me what you want me to know about you. Tell me your story. How did you come to learn English? What do you love about English? What do you hate about English? What do you want me to know about you? And having them do those writing tasks at the beginning of a session, or some of them used to do videos where they would just record themselves um, if they didn't want to do the writing activity, giving them that choice, of course. Do they want to write it or do they want to, to, to video it? Was a lovely way for me to get to know them. And then I, I worked hard, and I have to still do it, to try to remember things that they tell me. And that's all part of that, creating that willingness to communicate, is you know, if I see someone say, oh, how did your football team do this weekend? Um, you know, and being English right now, my football team did really well just now, especially my female football team. Well, absolutely. <laughs> Didn't they just? <laughs> there had to be an opportunity to bring that in somehow, right? Of course. Right? <laughs> <laughs> there had to be. No, it, it's quite something um, for us, isn't it? Well, um, a, a, word, a word that you've used a couple of times so far already um, during our conversation has been agency. Mm -hmm. And for the uninitiated, I wonder if you could say a little about what the, the concept of agency is. So agency and engagement for me are very intricately connected. So agency is the sense that you have some control over what happens to you and you're willing to do something to 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 take some responsibility and some to direct in some way what happens to you. So it's feeling that you can and feeling that you want to. Um, and that's for me hugely important um it's actually a bit of a chicken and egg it's a prerequisite for engagement but the more engaged you are the more sense of agency you develop so it, you know the two feed into each other if you can create that sense of agency in a learner they are more likely to engage because they feel that they can they feel that they can make a difference to their learning they feel that they have got some control over what happens they feel that their actions make a difference and, you know, then we going back to mindsets and other things as well. So agency is that feeling that what you do makes a difference, feeling you have some control, feeling that you want to and can make a difference to your learning. So for me, it's a prerequisite of engagement. But when we get learners engaged and when they start to see their success and when they see that they're creating output in the language and that the people are understanding and they're having communicative successes and so on, that feeds back into that sense of agency because they can see you know what I was successful I did that and 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 I actually produced something like that and my teacher understood or my colleagues understood and they have those little moments of success and that feeds back into that sense of agency um, and hopefully starts that positive upward spiral we're all you've 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 used a really nice term there um, that I haven't heard before communicative success I think I probably get the general idea but can you say something about that 
Yeah, but I mean, you know, communicative language teaching was all about, and we lose sight of it. And when I say we, I mean me very much here as well as everybody else, is very often um, exams and testing and also even course books focus really on accuracy. Despite the fact we claim that we're doing communicative language teaching, very often the exams, the kind of feedback we give, we're really focusing on mistakes and focusing on what's wrong and what you need to do better. And that can take us to the whole area of appreciative inquiry, which we'll come back to later. But um communicative success is seeing that you've tried to communicate a meaningful message and the other person understood you and was able to respond and you were able to understand what they were saying that's communicative success and um maybe sometimes we we forget how hugely impressive that is um you know my mum and dad are in their late 70s and when they have a moment of communicative success even if it's a single word of german that they use and the person at the cash desk understands that's reason for a celebration at the end of the day. You know, they're thrilled that somebody understood them. And it doesn't matter what the grammar was. It doesn't matter that they had complete English syntax, but they had that one word and they used it and the person understood them. So I think helping learners see when they have those moments of success and, and will we'll come to appreciative inquiry is the whole education system in most countries, and I can't speak for everywhere, is deficit oriented. What is wrong and what needs improving? And that's for learners, but it's also for teachers. So when teachers are under review or when they're in teacher education programs, it's very often that um, observers go in and they say, this is what you're doing wrong and this is what you need to do to make you better. Now, it's not to say that that doesn't have its place, but it's a whole ethos of thinking in terms of what's wrong and what needs to be made better. And there's a massive place, in my view, for saying, what's going well? What are people doing successfully? What are their strengths? How can we understand that and build on that and transfer on that? And being very conscious about that as an ethos to say to learners, not in some kind of vacuous praise where you say, oh, that was very nice. And now I'm going to tell you what was really wrong. You know, there's, there's, I don't mean that kind of praise. I mean, really where you say, this is what I think you did well. This is why you did it well. This is what you could do in the future. Why, why do you think this was such a success? Okay, let's pull out the features that were great about this and how you can use those in the future. So really critically analyzing really very specific, really constructive, positive feedback is a very different thing to this kind of vacuous praise where people say, this was a lovely text, but now I'm gonna tell you all the things you did wrong. But actually, you know, really constructively saying, you know, let's have a look at this. Let's look at what went well here. How can we build on that? And, you know, thinking about the context that different people are working in here, focusing on strengths is very empowering for everybody and very necessary at, at any point of time. And so being able to say, let's see what we can see. What did what did you do well here? What can we do? Um, it's not to deny those negatives, but there's actually a whole body of research that shows that you can grow and improve by understanding your strengths and doing more of them. But that's just not the ethos that most of us have grown up in. We've grown up in a very different way of thinking and culture. Um, and I think at the very least, we should be aiming for more of a balance between the two. That's very interesting. And is that, is that something presumably to do with, well, the fact that I suppose us, a lot of our students have to sit for exams, international exams, and there's a, you know, criteria by which the output is judged, as it were. No? Yeah, I think that's mm. part of it. And, you know, I think we have well, this, this whole culture is about what did I do wrong and how can I make it better? And, you know, um, action research for teachers has always been positioned about where's your problem and how can you make it better? As opposed to saying, why not go into someone's class and say, what went brilliantly? How amazing? What can we learn from that? And how can we use that in other settings? So there is as much potential for growth and improvement by drawing on strengths and looking for transferability and understanding moments of success um, and thinking about how that can be used in other settings and not just always focusing on the deficit and what's wrong. Um, when we get learners to get a text and they look at what they've done right, that understanding that, why did it do right? How could I use that in a different setting? What were my strategies? What can I, what can I learn from this for the future for other contexts? 
can be deeply empowering. If, you know, coming back to the sense of agency, giving learners a sense that there is stuff you can do. It's not all wrong. Um, and I think this is hugely important for teachers as well. I think teachers are socially conditioned into this idea of what you, you know, you, there's something wrong that needs improving. Mm. You know, what most teachers are doing a fantastic job in difficult mm. circumstances. So, you know, let's focus on what's going well and what's brilliant and how we can build and do more of that. You know, not always just looking at what's not going yeah, well. There's, um because there's like three or four questions that have already come up in the chat box but actually Sarah I'd like to go down that 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 rabbit hole a little bit that you've just mentioned about the idea of well failure in a way as in why perhaps students and I know we're sort of on the topic of young learners here but might feel like they do about failure and whether that that sort of overshadows the good parts, if you see what I mean. I'm not being very articulate about this, but I think you know what I'm saying. Perhaps just expand off. a teeny bit more. <laughs> <laughs> so then, with with a with a lot of younger learners, if they're they do tend to get. I mean, I'm I'm certainly talking about um, my case. I teach fourth year at a, a local school, and hopefully, most of them will be sitting for the first certificate exam this year. Um, when they don't do so well in any kind of paper as it were they tend to get very frustrated with themselves um and i wonder if that sort of fear of failure overshadows everything else sometimes i'm, I'm absolutely sure that it does mm. okay so now we get into some of the sort of slightly messy areas of the psychology of why this happens so there are different you know there are different reasons why all of the things that you talk about happen is um and we're back i suppose let's go back to this sense of agency if you feel that there is nothing you can do to improve your learning, you will be afraid of failure and you will feel helpless. And the whole notion of learned helplessness comes from this idea that when you, um, when you try to do something, if you don't believe there's anything you can really do to change the outcome, you feel a sense of helplessness that you're not even gonna necessarily try. So we're back to the idea of mindsets. And I know mindsets is highly contentious, but I, I, I don't care. <laughs> I've, I've, I've taught for 20 something years. I've worked with a lot of teachers I've had the privilege of working with. And every teacher I know says, yeah, I recognize that. I see it in my learners. Um, that if, for those of you, I think most people here will be familiar with the notion of mindsets, but just very quickly, if you're not, there's two sort of ways you can think about your abilities as a language learner. Do you think that your abilities are kind of given and there's not much you can do to change them, fix mindset? Or do you think that actually I can do things, I can try new strategies, I can maybe put more effort in, I can maybe work with somebody else to learn from them. That's a kind of growth orientation. And again, those tend to function on a continuum. So they're often presented as dichotomous separate categories, which is also unhelpful that people tend to, first of all, people move along it in different areas and they have periods of time where they think more in one way and the other. And I think if we can get learners to have that sense of agency, that when they experience a failure, that they can stay, OK, what options do I have so that this doesn't happen again? Do I have a vision of a pathway that I can take so that there's something I can do? And the whole notion of constructive feedback, formative assessment, all of that is based on that notion of trying to empower learners with a sense of what can I do now? There's nothing more disempowering than someone saying this is a fail and that's it and you don't know what to do with it. So constructive feedback, formative assessment, all of those things have been based on this notion that they need strategies, they need direction, they need ideas of how to move forward. But first and foremost, almost before that, is that they have to believe that those things will make a difference and that they have some control over what happens to them. So this is where we get into the idea of attributions is that when you, when you for both failure and success, when you, are, when you fail at something or you're successful at something, attributions are the reasons you give for that. And do you, the reasons you give, are they for something that's out of your control? So the teacher just hates me. There's not much you're gonna be able to do about that if you think that that is true, or it was luck that I was successful. You're not gonna be able to replicate that if that's what you really believe. So being able to say, well, you know, I, I was successful here because I, I worked hard, I took a bit of extra time, I had my neighbor work with me on this, we practiced on this, I did an extra practice text, then you've got ideas of what you can do in the future, it, it, it makes it there's some potential there. So 
when you have a success or a failure, as teachers, we can talk to learners. Now, why do you think this happened? What could you do differently next time? How can I help you that next time would look different? Um, so rather than it be a fait accompli that leaves you helpless, what potential do you have to make a difference to your learning in the future? And like I say, if this was all an easy recipe, Alistair, you know, I'd have made my millions and be on the beach. But it, 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 for some learners, that's easier to achieve. And for some learners, that will be really difficult. Mm. So the but, other word, you know, sorry, the other word for no mindset one. is the other word for mindset is implicit theories. And the whole idea is that these are very deeply held, it means that you might not even be conscious of them in some cases. And it also means they're hard to change. Mm. And they don't change just by doing one activity. They change gradually and slowly over time. So if they have had educational experiences in the past that have strongly socialized them in a certain way of thinking about themselves and about learning, you're not going to change that in one or two activities. That's a slow process of change. And you, you're introducing a new culture in your classroom where we talk about the learning and we think about learning differently. So you, as, as, us as educators, you, 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 you work with the learners that you've got, but they all bring their histories with them. And some people will be more ready and more open. And some people, it will be a harder journey for change. Yeah. And I think we're getting into the territory of one of the things I wanted to ask you about, actually, is the idea of self-concept in language learning. Could you say something about that for us? Oh, I could. It's my favourite thing. Oh, so that's what I, it's what I started. Whole, it's what I started my whole professional journey on. So when I was a language teacher, um, I started as a language teacher, and I was I was convinced, and I still am convinced, of the importance of learning strategies. And this was, of course, huge in the 80s and 90s. Again, not wishing to show my age, but, you know, learning how to learn was um, a big thing at those times. So I did a little bit of research, part of my MA thesis in those days, and I discovered that actually the benefits for the learners of knowing how to learn didn't make any real difference to their language outcomes. But it made a massive difference to how confident they felt to be able to tackle learning. And that was for me... I don't know, it sounds really, maybe it sounds really sort of, you know, uh, naive now. Um, but at the time, that was a big understanding for me was to understand that how a learner sees themselves and their relationship to learning, how empowered they feel, their sense of self, is going to make a massive difference to how they approach their learning, what, what risks they take, what strategies they use, um, how willing they are to put effort in and so on. And a lot of the early research back in those days when it was looking at strategy interventions, what it looked at was, did the strategy intervention lead to linguistic gains? Well, very often it didn't because obviously the time span was unrealistic in most cases. And my conclusion was that the benefits of things like strategy training were on the psychology of the learner. That's the benefits of doing strategy training. And the, that will affect how they approach their learning. And eventually that will lead to gains linguistically. But that's not, those are not things that happen over a six week intervention. That, that's things that are going to happen over a much longer period of time. Um, so that's how, that, that's how I came to be interested in the self. And self-concept is how learners um, view themselves as a learner. And we can see ourselves, you know, learners see themselves in different domains. So by this, I mean, they may see themselves as very confident when it comes to speaking, but not at all confident when it comes to writing, for example. So it doesn't mean they have just one self-concept, me as an English learner. They do, but they make distinctions. And the more experienced they are, the more distinctions they will make. So, you know, <laughs> a stupid example, I have no experience of rock climbing. And so if you ask me my self-concept of a rock climber, I've got, I can't have a very differentiated self-concept because I don't know much about rock climbing. So I don't know what areas I could have strengths and weaknesses. But what I do is I look at other areas that I think are related. So agility, um, my love of yoga, other things. And then I say, well, I'm good at this. So I might be good at that. And so I, I might have strengths in that area. So your self-concept is made up of, you draw on other areas of your life that you think are relevant. 
the more experience you have in a domain, the more complex your sense of self is. So when you're just setting out, you, you, you don't have much to go on. So you will pick other areas of your life and say that's related. So if this is your first foreign language that you're learning, you'll look at how you do in your mother tongue and you might make comparisons or very typically people make comparisons to maths. So they say, oh, you know, I'm I'm really good at math, so I'm going to be rubbish at languages, which is completely wrong. But that's what happens. You know, we compare across domains. So when you form your sense of self, it becomes more complex, more experience you have. You can make distinctions across different areas and you form it based on your own understanding of what the language learner is, what you think a good language learner is. You compare yourself to other areas of your life, but you also compare yourself to others. And that can be extremely problematic for a whole host of reasons. But it's natural that you look at somebody else and you say, well, they're, they're finding it much easier than I'm finding it. So I mustn't be very good at it. And that's where it can be really important to help learners focus on their own sense of progress so that they see that they're improving. And I think that remains a huge challenge in language teaching is progression in language teaching is much more gradual and subtle, less so at the beginning fundamentally than you see big jumps. But later on, it becomes um, sometimes difficult for learners to see that they're still improving. Um, and whatever you say about can do statements, I know all the issues with can do statements and portfolios, but the idea of making progress visible for learners so that they see I can do this now, but I couldn't do this six weeks ago is really helpful for developing a positive sense of self. Let's talk about that for a second, because that's I think, especially today with thanks to as it were social media there's probably quite a huge amount of comparisons going on especially with younger people comparing themselves to other younger people celebrities etc um and yes so perhaps in a classroom if someone like like you say sees that someone else is finding something easier um what what might be a way of connecting with that student and trying not to get them to compare themselves with 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 somebody else um, I mean, you, you can't stop it. You, you, you can't stop it. It's going to happen anyway. You can't stop that. That's going to happen anyway. But it's about, again, coming back to the sense of agency, giving them a sense that they that that this is attainable. So when we talk about role models in language education, one of the. I mean, I'm not even going to open that whole can of worms, but one of the problems has been that some of the models used for language are, and I'm going to use the term very deliberately now, native speaker models. And you come to the whole question of how realistic is that for most learners? How attainable does that feel? And the wonderful Tim Murphy in Japan with his colleagues started working on something many years ago called near peer role models. And I just love this idea that he looks at people who are close and attainable goals for learners to aspire to. So rather than looking at model texts from a native speaker or model texts from somebody else or looking at that, they look at somebody who feels closer. So he calls them near peers. So it's a little bit like going back to this idea of, you know, zone of proximal development and looking at who is just above where you want to be but it's comparable in some way to you. So you identify with them, you see some similarities to them and how can that be motivating? And it's motivating if you believe that you have the resources and the potential to become like that person so that they don't seem that they are, you know, wildly unattainable goals, which a lot of the models in, in course books and also that are spoken about are, feel that way. But this is a model that feels like, mm, do you know what? I, I think I could do that. And, and how would I go about doing that? And how could I become like that? How could I get to be like that in terms of my language use? And he was there way before everybody else. And I think this is, I think it's a fantastic way of conceptualizing role models in language learning. And say it again, it's called, what's the term? Near, near peer role models, hmm. near peer. So not an, doesn't have to necessarily be an immediate peer, but someone who's a near peer. So somebody who is maybe similar in age, similar in language background, um, but, but you know, just one step above, it can be somebody from a year above. So there's a lot of mentorship programs go on between um, one year above and one year below in school. And that's done deliberately, this mentorship programs, because they're a near peer, they're, a little bit older, a little bit more experienced, but they're attainable. They're not, you know, they're not far removed from where they are, but they're just that sort of one zone up from where they would like to be current or where they currently are. Do you think, because I really like the idea, and I, I think as a teacher, what I might worry about is 
a possible flip side of that, which is again the sort of slight envy of not being of, of not that it's not attainable, but that that person is is the teacher's pet, as it were, if you see what I mean. Uh, okay, yeah. So okay, so I'll tell you what I used to do. Um, I'm not saying that this is 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 the ideal solution, but this is what I used to do is. I used to take when I let's, for example, say I asked them to write a text for homework. I would pick out all my favorite bits and make a text out of everybody's text and pick all the favorite bits. out. And I try not always possible to pick a little bit from most people's text and work it in. And then I'd give them the text and, as a model and say, now, have a look at this and see what you think. Um, put your hand up if you recognize something that you did. And most people would put their hand up and they see it. I say, right, so this is not made by me. I mean, I've just put it together by picking my favorite bits, but this is something that you guys in this class have created and that you have the potential to create. Um, I'm not, I haven't got any research basis for telling you that story, except that that's how I tended to do it when I was teaching my language classes, because I didn't want to pick an individual learner and make them fit, you know, and I wanted to make it as inclusive as possible. So I, I don't have any research justification for that strategy. That was just purely, it seemed to work for me and my learners. And it was driven by this ethos of making them see what they could do, mm. um, but not pinning it on one person necessarily. I really love that idea. I really do. Um, it, certainly not something I've thought of before. So it was, it was like, well, just maybe some sentences or even phrases yeah, yeah, from a, a phrase. variety. Yeah, and just I just picked it, pieced it together, and you'd have to write a little bit to make it flow, but not, you know. But, but the important thing for me was that majority of the learners could recognise bits of their own text, um, and when they got into the, we did get into this little bit of habit. They say you haven't prepared us a text. You know, we, we haven't got where's our text where, you know, <laughs> I'm so sorry. And um, so we did get a little bit into that sometimes. So you have to, you know, but um, it's nice when they know to look out for themselves. And it's also maybe maybe it becomes a little bit of a motivation that I, you know, I want to write one of those magic sentences that's going to appear in that text. That's that's the interesting thing, because that that's what, one of the things I like about that idea is them look, looking out for that. I like it very much. And that leads me in i'm going to come up with a couple of questions from the the chat box now i'm actually going to cut and paste one in for you um this is from nafis who has asked um well i'll, I'll paraphrase but your thoughts on um making uh, elt game-based a game-based approach oh i love this topic and i love this question great question nafis thank you um so I'm going to get a book. Let me hold on. Shall we go and get you a book and show you a book? Great. Well done, Nafis. You've in, in, inspired Sarah. Inspired to get a book. So let me just get a book and tell you, and then I can tell you why. So there you go. Nafis, that's for you. You'll enjoy that. Trust me. All good. Can you see? Yep. Nafis, nod if you can see. Okay. So one of the things, this wonderful book called Glued to Games is all about the psychology of gaming and why it is so addictive. Now, that's not a bad thing to understand because that helps us understand engagement. Engagement comes from a lot of these principles that are in gaming. Gaming just utilizes the principles of what engages people and employs that for gaming purposes. Now, one of the problems that we've been, and I'm no expert on this, Nafi, so don't let me get too carried away. You'll have to, you know, one of the problems has been is when it's reduced to leadership boards and points, that isn't what gaming is about. So my understanding, and like I say, my understanding is primarily from books like this, is that the principles of gaming are things like, okay, so why do people love, um, why has gaming become much more popular than watching films? Because the gamer is the agent because they make stuff happen. They're not passive recipients. They make things happen. They are the agent, they're the hero of the story. And those kinds of principles are massively helpful and important to understand in education. And um, we, we mustn't make the mistake of saying gamification is not about making it all about leadership boards and points. That's, the, that's a, a complete misunderstanding of the complexity of what gamification is. And that's when it gets a bad reputation and goes wrong. 
because that leads to competition. It leads to learning for the points and not doing it. So I had a wonderful student. She looked at the principles of gamification in the language classroom and she designed, oh, bless her cotton socks. She designed this most fantastic series of uh, game-based lessons, English lessons around certain grammatical and functional structures. And she was mortified to discover, I mean, fair game, the students told her that the students were cheating terribly with what she had designed and she was heartbroken, bless her. And so I said, you know, look at this as an opportunity. Talk to the students, why did they cheat? You know, um, we can probably guess, but you know, have that conversation with them about why did they cheat? Why did they not do the tasks the way you'd envisage and so on? And of course it becomes all about the points. It becomes about winning. It becomes about the points. It doesn't become about mastery. It becomes about performance. And that's this whole notion in education is you have a distinction between what are known as mastery goals and performance goals. And that's also linked to extrinsic and intrinsic motivation is, are you driven by the performance and the output and how you are viewed by others? Or are you driven by mastery? You want to learn, you want to know, you want to achieve it for yourself. And one of the problems that has happened because of, in my view, very simplistic understandings of gamification is it's created a whole culture of performance orientation as opposed to mastery. And really understanding gamification is about understanding the agency of the actor to make decisions and choices. You have the wonderful thing, they call it replay in gamification. So replay is the idea, if you make a mistake, you know what, you just do it again, and you try again, and you try again. What I mean, what can be a better principle for education? Um, you have the idea in gaming of leveling up, so that when you achieve something, you move to the next level and you move to the next level and you see your progress and you are constantly challenged. So you come to this wonderful notion of desirable difficulty that, you know, another misunderstanding in education is things should be easy. Well, you know, easy is boring and that's a guaranteed way to get to low engagement. So healthy challenge, what they call desirable difficulty is that just being difficult enough that you're challenged, that it, it pushes you a little bit. And so we must get away from this idea that challenge is a bad thing. Learners need to be challenged um, and it's a good thing and it's a great way to keep them engaged. So <laughs> I went on a little rant then, I apologize about that, but the idea is, is that you know gamification, when it's properly understood in its complexity of the psychology behind it, offers a lot of very valuable insights into how people get engaged, why they get engaged, how they feel empowered, and how we keep their attention. Simple things. One of the things that works with games is you can think about the, the, the simplicity of instructions, being able to manage things. That can be a very easy way in. So low thresholds and entry thresholds into the accessibility of tasks. So there's masses of things I think that we can learn from that but I, I think there is a caveat to be added that when gamification is oversimplified it can actually be damaging for motivation and engagement um, and so it needs treating with caution um, I hope that answers the question I'm I've been trying to write look at you listen to you and write down some amazing things that you've been saying um, I really love the concept of desirable difficulty apart mm. from anything else. And I see that I'm not the only one, Phil Maud has put in the chat box, sorry if I'm not pronouncing your name well, the aha moment as to why game is preferred over film. And I can say that my, my partner, Florencia, her younger sister, Miranda, she's 15, and she loves The Walking Dead, but um, <laughs> she would much rather play games online and talk to people in English, funnily enough. Well, I mean, she's from Argentina, but talk to them in English because that's like the lingua franca while she's doing it. Uh, that's very it's brilliant <laughs> it makes it makes a lot of sense desirable difficulty that's that's great um okay i'm gonna ask you another question that's come up in the chat box as well um right a while ago i apologize to fasa for asking because they asked this question a long time ago and i'm just putting it in the chat box for you again sarah um, is there any specific indicator or sign that we can, where we can see that our students are successfully engaged or not? Oh, Fassi, you couldn't have asked me a, a better question. These questions are great because they're, they're touching on a lot of my favourite things. So we did this awesome study um, with our students here at the University of Graz, and we uncovered something that we called fake engagement. Um, and I'm just going to look at everybody's face in the room now when I say this. 
and you might even be doing it to me right now, which is even worse thing to think about is pretending to be engaged where you nod wisely and you smile at your teacher and, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and you're miles away. You're just not paying any attention whatsoever to what they're saying, but you nod very wisely and you smile and whatever. So one of the problems with engagement, um, and I suspect we've all fallen for it, is learners are not stupid um, and they are very adept at pretending to be engaged. Now, equally, teachers are pretty adept at detecting when their learners are pretending to be engaged. But goodness gracious, we discovered that the learners have some quite elaborate strategies for displaying engagement. Now, what I think is quite important to understand about this is if your learners go to the trouble of faking their engagement, it means they actually respect you. They don't want to insult you. So we did have some learners who said, this guy doesn't know what he's doing. He doesn't pay any attention. He doesn't prepare. I don't care if he knows I'm not engaged. So, you know, it's actually, you know, if they're making the effort to pretend to be engaged, it's because they've still got enough respect for you that they don't want you to be too disappointed in what they're doing. So that's, let's look at the plus side first. Um, so the difficulty very often is knowing the difference between genuine active engagement, and that ought to be something that we're able to see in when they complete activities, they do activities, they're using the language, they're working on task. Um, the, the classic way is when they ask questions. Anybody who's asking a question has to be engaged in order to be able to ask a meaningful question that's connected. So asking questions is one thing they can do. Um, usually the degree of... Um, uh, well, actually, that was also something that came up, but um, being able to focus their attention, complete the task, use the language, um, and also fundamentally things like when you can see that they're enjoying it, and teachers are pretty good at reading student body language. Um, most experienced teachers can see, you, you know, you, you read the room, you know. Um, when it is, and you, you, you tend to sort of know who's faking it, but discovering quite how much they go to such lengths to fake it is a little alarming and it should be for the whole of the University of Graz I'm mortified <laughs> so um but I think it's um like I said I don't think when students fake it it's necessarily a bad thing I think sometimes we have to accept they're not going to be engaged 100% in every lesson you know what they've got lives too and uh, I, when we strive to have our learners engaged, sometimes it's healthier for us to also accept that isn't going to be all the time, every time. And it's OK sometimes if they're just not engaged. It's not the end of the world. And if there's a bit of time, if they're perpetually not engaged, there's a problem. But if they have dips in their engagement during a lesson or they have a lesson where they're just not quite with it, that's life. We, we have good and bad days, too. So I don't think we need to beat ourselves up about engagement. But, um, you know, I, I think teachers are generally very sensitive to reading the room and maybe creating the opportunity for learners to ask questions as opposed to as asking questions is one way to get them to display their engagement. So one of the things that I introduced in my introductory lecture was that I said, um, I'm going to ask the first question to somebody in the room and then you guys have to ask the rest of the questions. So I would say, let's say, for example, Alistair, I'm going to ask you whatever it was. And then you would answer. And I'd say, OK, pick somebody else that you want to ask a question of. And then Alistair would say, OK, Fasa, I'd like to ask you. And Fasa, Alistair would ask Fasa a question. And then Fasa would say, OK, Anna, I'd like to ask you a question. So that it became a domino effect that wasn't controlled by me, but was controlled by the learners. And I, I made a deliberate point of saying it's the ball's got to go around the room. You've got to make sure everybody gets to answer the question. And they have to pay attention if they're able to ask questions of each other. So it's not just answering the questions. It's being able to pose the questions is a good sign that they're, they're, they're on the ball and they're with you. Because the, the classroom in, in any situation, really, I suppose, be it online, face to face, is is a community, isn't it? And it sounds like what you're talking about a little bit is building that community. Is that right? Yeah, and that takes us neatly back to what we talked about at the beginning, that, you know, willingness to engage comes from developing that social emotional climate, that sense of community, that sense of belonging, that sense of shared identity, that sense of, of tolerance and respect for each other, that sense of acceptance for each other. Um, and those are things that you can't create with a single activity. That is a culture that a teacher develops in their class through everything that they do. So, you know, we're back to this whole, you know, we have an explicit curriculum that we teach 
and we have the implicit curriculum that we teach through how we behave, how we interact with learners, how we talk to people. And that communicates as much about climate as any deliberate explicit activity that you can do. And they're not instant remedy activities to create a climate in a class and you create that culture and that climate in your group over time. Um, and it's something that you build. And for me, it's one of the foundations of, of, of engagement. The implicit curriculum and the explicit curriculum. This is fantastic. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I know we're coming up to the hour mark now. However, there is something that I, one more thing that I'd like to ask you, if that's all right, which is something that you and I touched on actually before the interview began today, Sarah. Um, we know that there's some teachers here teaching in some bloody difficult circumstances. One of the things that you and I talked about briefly at the beginning was teacher well-being in a, in a certain way. You, I think you mentioned I'm going to really badly paraphrase you just for a change. Um, <laughs> you mentioned breaking um, teaching up into like bite-sized chunks for classes in, in certain circumstances. You're nodding, thank goodness. Okay. I yeah, hope that's no, not I fake engagement. Okay. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> yes, uh, no, 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 um, no, I know what you're talking about now. So we talked about um, one of the principles behind engagement is holding attention. So engagement and attention are very closely related. Um, and sometimes um, learners can get deeply into a task and they can be engaged for a longer period of time. But that's becoming more and more difficult to do. And certainly for people working in difficult circumstances where there are a lot of distractions and a lot of disruptions, that's going to be very hard to do anyway. So for any teacher in any circumstances, but perhaps particularly for people in more difficult circumstances where you're working, um, thinking about the lesson in chunks. So thinking about, you know, breaking things down into chunks. So rather than thinking about the whole lesson and big activities, but, you know, very deliberately saying, we're going to make this into bite-sized pieces. And I know that there's a lot of criticism about that approach to teaching, and I know why. But sometimes the pragmatics of certain circumstances may say, you know what, that's what I need to do. And these chunks that you can do, you can break a lesson plan down into bite-sized pieces into chunks means that they're doing different activities. There's some variety, there's a break, there's a way, a new chance to get attention. They don't have to hold their attention for a long period of time before they move on to another activity. So it's controversial. I, I'm the first person to admit that it's controversial to say that. And there's a lot of desirability about getting learners into a state of flow where they spend an extended period of time on a task where they get really into it. But for some settings, that's unrealistic in my view. And, um, you know, goodness gracious, even in the setting that I work in, a very privileged luxury setting, half an hour of attention nonstop is pushing my luck sometimes, um, particularly when we're coming up to holidays. So um, I think there is a time that the teacher themselves will know that this approach is maybe more pragmatic and that rather than planning big chunks and trying to do whole activities, that you plan in terms of chunks, digestible, manageable chunks, where there's a visible break, a visible change of pace, a visible doing something different, and that then you're not tasked with keeping your learners engaged for the whole one hour or 90 minutes or 45 minutes, how long your session is. We're just going to do something to keep their attention for about 10 minutes. And then we're going to do something else that keeps them for about 10 minutes. And of course, they're going to be thematically linked or connected in some way. It's not like you're doing a complete random jumble of things, but that the planning is thought of in terms of these manageable chunks rather than a whole unit, um, which can be a bit overwhelming in some settings. Yeah, that, that completely makes a lot of sense. And I really like that idea of, of, of making things more manageable that way, um, especially the Yes, but like you're saying, it's interesting because you're obviously in a different context. I'm in a different context as well, but then still managing to get to focus for a X, X period of time is, um, is, is absolutely priceless. Um, there's so many things, Sarah, that you've said today that I've, I've written down and I, I hope, I really hope I remember them. Um, thank you so very much. I especially to sort of wrap it up a bit, I really love this idea of the the implicit curriculum and the the classroom as a as a community. And do you, do you think it's something that um, that teachers should we, we should all sort of pay attention to a bit more that idea of the implicit curriculum? Oh, you know, I'm very wary about using the word should with teachers ever. Uh, the wonderful late uh, Elaine Horvitz said, "Stop shoulding teachers and telling them what they should do." 
So I'm reluctant to add to this notion of anything that anyone should do. Most teachers have got enough things that they're doing. Um, but we communicate a lot about our values and what's important to us and what we expect from learners and what we expect in our classes and how we expect them to behave together through how we talk, how we behave, how we respond to things. Um, it doesn't mean we're saints, don't get me wrong. We'll all have our moments and we'll all make mistakes. And being self-compassionate and forgiving ourselves for getting it wrong sometimes is probably the most important thing I can ask you to do is nobody's perfect, no teacher's perfect. None of us get it right all the time. We all make mistakes, we all get it wrong sometimes. That's how it is. That's life. And forgiving yourself for sometimes getting it wrong is probably the most important thing you can do. Um, but demonstrating that self-compassion to yourself um, is a very good role model for your learners as well. If you want them to accept their mistakes and you want them to accept when they sometimes get it wrong and when they don't do it perfectly, um, you need to be able to um, embody that for yourself as well and, and go easy on yourself sometimes when it doesn't always go according to plan. Sarah, thank you so much. Very thank you, everyone, for being here today. And um, I'm going to put onto gallery view. So I think you'll probably see everyone anyway, Sarah. Um, so if we all give Sarah a little round of applause, thank you so much for joining thank us you. today. It's been an absolute pleasure, an absolute pleasure. And thank you I for asking me to join you. And all my best wishes to those of you who are working in such difficult circumstances in Ukraine. We are thinking of you and we have you in our thoughts and prayers. We absolutely do. That's that's completely true. And I, for my part, I'm going to be putting this video up on social media once it has all converted, etc. I want to say thank you again to Kenya and Academia Arguejo for um, allowing us to use this room. Uh, without it, this would not be possible. So thank you very much, Sarah. Um, let's let's do this again sometime. I'm sure Happily. everyone would love that. Yes, I could talk to you all day with no problem at all. <laughs> right. Thank you so much. Take care, everybody. Thank Stay you tight. all. Take care. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye for now, everyone. Bye.